はい。So you're on mute. <laughs> Cool. Now I'm good. How's it going? Well, so far so good. How about yourself? Pretty good. So let's see here. Hi, Jane. It just asked me to allow people to join a couple people. Hopefully it doesn't keep doing that. Yeah. Hi, Jane. I'm going to just pause the recording for a minute while okay. we get set up. Perfect. All right, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. I know that in, during this um, sort of time of everything being up in the air, um, it's kind of tough to get everything taken care of, so we certainly appreciate you all being here today. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, today's session is being recorded, so please make sure to keep your microphones on mute unless um, a section comes up where the presenter is asking for um, questions or um, asking for uh, feedback or anything like that. Um, you can ask questions in the chat box or you can unmute yourself to ask those questions. Uh, if you have not already, please make sure to type your name title, agency, and email address into the chat box so that we can record that you were here today. Um, so I'll just do a little bit of background on Jane here, our presenter. Jane Flournoy manages the two Gen initiatives and adolescent behavioral health programs within the Office of Behavioral Health. Jane is the senior state authority on culturally informed and inclusive programs as well as adolescent behavioral health services and has worked with adolescents who have co-occurring mental health and substance use disorder issues in a number of settings, including residential treatment centers, public health, the division of youth services, child welfare, and community corrections. And with that, Jane, I'll pass it off to you. Um, just let me know when you need to advance the slide and I will make sure to do so. Okay, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up? Yeah, okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I just want to preface this particular presentation with um, the fact that I, like many of you, have picked up a side gig homeschooling my children during um, during all of all of this staying at home. So, if you hear fighting or yelling in the background, apologies in advance. <laughs> <laughs> trying to navigate this um, like many, many of the rest of you. So um, with that, um, this next hour is really going to be spent um, going over some of the information um, that our office thinks would be most helpful when really trying to get folks to conceptualize um, what we really mean when we're talking about the intersection of mental health issues and substance use disorder issues for adolescents. So we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so just to give folks a little bit of background about who we are, um, the Office of Behavioral Health lives within the State Department of Human Services. So um, CDHS, as it's known, the Colorado Department of Human Services, houses a number of different offices. So there's the Office of Children, Youth, and Families, which is um, the office that really helps to oversee all of the, the 64 child welfare um, county-run agencies throughout the state, as well as the Division of Youth Services, 
Um, the Department of Human Services also received the Office of Early Childhood, um, Child Care Licensing Programs, and then our office, the Office of Behavioral Health, we're really tasked with overseeing the public behavioral health system in Colorado, as well as supporting services and the provision of services for individuals who are either uninsured or underinsured. So within the Office of Behavioral Health, we, um, we have regulations and we license about 660 substance use disorder agencies throughout the state. And we also designate all of the 17 statewide community mental health centers. We oversee the crisis services system. If you've heard of the, um, the crisis services hotline or mobile crisis units, um, that's overseen by our office. We also house the state two mental health institutes. So we have the Mental Health Institute at Fort Logan, and we also have our Mental Health Institute down in Pueblo. Um, and then we also regulate um, various practices to include 2765 procedures. So that's when someone goes on um, maybe a mental health hold and has their rights restricted so that they can receive services um, really to best meet um, their mental health needs at the time and to make sure that they're not a threat to themselves or others. So aside from the regulatory component of what our office does to ensure a level of quality of care and a standard of care for Colorado statewide, um, a large part of what we do, again, is funding. And so we receive money from the federal government and then we distribute that money statewide to um, regional managed service organizations, to regional accountability entities with the hope that then those agencies help to fund um, services again being offered to folks who otherwise could not um, access behavioral health services that they need. So um, aside from those things, our office also really seeks to offer um, a lot of technical assistance and training and support to programs. And so, um, so really that's how you ended up with me today. One of the things that we do is provide training. And so this particular training, again, will be on um, focusing on co-occurring disorders within adolescents and some of the things that, that you might want to keep in mind. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, and so if we can go to the slide on objectives, um, really there's a few things that we want to be able to accomplish here today. And it looks like maybe maybe our slides might be stuck. So I'll just kind of keep going. Um, but really we want to, in this next hour or so, we want to really have a good understanding of what we mean when we're talking about co-occurring disorders. And we want to have an understanding of how those present um, within adolescents. And then um, we really also want to then understand what are some of the characteristics of effective programs um, that can really help to meet the needs of adolescents so that they can be um, successful in their recovery and successful in whatever it is they're hoping to do. Um, and so part of what we'll do is we'll go over the practice guidelines for um, you know, sort of best practices for how adolescents are treated. And then let's see, Gianna, are we able to advance the slides? I, I apologize, Jen. My computer has like gone on the fritz here. So let me oh, okay. see if I can get no it. No problem. Okay, so while while we wait for that, um, I'll just kind of keep going. And so the next slide illustrates um, really what co-occurring disorders are. And so Co-occurring disorders are two or more disorders that um, are present at the same time. And so um, this really refers to a combination of one or more substance use disorders alongside one or more mental health disorders. And so that's really what we're talking about. Um, sometimes you might hear um, folks talking about um, dual diagnosis and dual, duly diagnosed clients. That that particular term being duly diagnosed refers to the idea of someone having both a mental health disorder 
as well as um, a cognitive disorder or a developmental disability. And so we just want to be clear that when we say co-occurring disorders, we mean a combination of mental health and substance use, whereas duly diagnosed is very specific to the developmentally disabled um, diagnosis paired with a mental health disorder. So that's, that's the difference in those language, in those terms. So how common are co-occurring disorders? Um, really, when we take a look at, let's see. So when we take, sorry, I've got another computer that I'm looking at the slides simultaneously just so I, I can kind of keep track of where we are. So when we think about how common co-occurring disorders are, and I'm on the slide that has the four options. So maybe one more. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so how, how often would you assume that, that this is um, a combination of, of what's presenting in your clients? Would you assume 65%, 27%, 74%, 52%? So if you want to respond in the chat, I can see. I can see your responses in the chat. And this is just, just a guess for the sake of guessing. Okay, we've got a guess floor A for 65%, 74%, 74%, 52%. Okay. So if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so the answer is 74%. Um, so really, when we think about um, what percentage of youth who were receiving services in an adolescent treatment center had a combination of mental health, um, of, of a diagnosed mental health disorder <clears throat> and a substance use disorder. And again, this was looking at um, information between 1998 and 2004. Um, the answer is really 74% of the youth who were being served in those agencies um, had both of those both of those things present. Um, so let's see. And then for youth receiving mental health services, you can see um, on the bottom of this slide, for youth receiving mental health services, 43% were also diagnosed with having a co-occurring substance use disorder. So if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so um so types of disorders. So in terms of co-occurring disorders, the substances that are most likely being used or abused are alcohol or marijuana, and that, that's based on nationwide information. Um, so certainly we know that regionally or in certain communities, we may see an uptick in a particular substance. We may see an uptick in um, opiate abuse, or we might see a, an uptick in you know, cocaine use or something like that. But nationwide as a whole, alcohol and marijuana tend to be the two substances that adolescents are using most commonly. And then paired with that, um, for co-occurring disorders, when we think about um, what's, what's occurring on the mental health side of the diagnosis, um, we, we see that the most common um, diagnoses are either conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder, um, mood disorders, and anxiety disorders. So, um, so some folks, you, you may be well aware, but just to kind of cover it, um, when it comes to conduct disorders or oppositional defiant disorders, these are really disorders where we see um, behaviors where youth are potentially power struggling with people in a position of authority. So that could be teachers, it could be parents, caregivers, um, it could be maybe supervisors at an after school job or coaches. Um, again, really anyone in a position of authority. And with conduct or oppositional defiant disorder, um, it really rises to the level of that diagnosis and we see a number of different negative consequences as a result. So we might see um, an increase in um, consequences at school or an increase in conflict at home. It may result in behaviors that are harmful to others or um, the, the oppositional defiant behaviors may be so extreme that the youth is um, either engaging in physical conflict or they are um, escaping by running away or skipping school, things like that. So, um, so that kind of comprises the, the conduct or oppositional defiant disorder. 
those particular disorders are considered um, to precipitate and what would what would be a diagnosis for adults as antisocial personality disorders. So um, for juveniles, we don't um, we don't typically assign that particular diagnosis. So a diagnosis of conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder would typically precede um, a diagnosis of antisocial personality traits. And, and a lot of the um, diagnostic criteria look similar. Um, any questions about that? And I'll just kind of check the chat periodically. So for mood disorders, um, this is where we might see a diagnosis of maybe a depressive disorder, or we might see a diagnosis of an adjustment disorder. Um, maybe, so with adjustment disorders, typically um, an event has occurred for an adolescent, um, maybe a move or um, divorce within the family, or maybe um, you know, some other, some other um, life event that they are struggling to respond or adapt to. So an adjustment disorder, um, we, might see, um, we might see tendencies towards um, being depressed. We might see tendencies towards oppositional behavior. Um, and then also um, certainly um, more organic disorders that, that might be developing, maybe something along the lines of bipolar disorder um, that would, would potentially fall in that category as well. For anxiety disorders, um, certainly this, this would include post-traumatic stress disorder. It might include social anxiety. It might um, be a generalized anxiety disorder. Um, we might see that a student struggles um, to, to really adapt to and be um, flexible and open and successful in various settings or may struggle with panic attacks. Um, those kinds of things. So, so really, these are the types of um, mental health disorders we're going to see um, as most prevalent, combined with, um, you know, as a co-occurring disorder combined with um, substance use issues. Again, which would typically or most commonly be alcohol or marijuana. So, if we could go to the next slide. Okay. So with, um, with mental health disorders, um, really we can conceptualize them as being either externalizing disorders or internalizing disorders. And very much of our system is designed to address externalizing disorders. So if you think about externalizing disorders, these are the things that um, are really readily apparent to the rest of us or um, very clearly are impacting the lives of not only the adolescents who are suffering from these disorders, um, but the individuals who are around them. So with a conduct disorder, certainly we, we would likely be hearing things like, you know, we've got a lot of conflict at home, my son or daughter is not listening, we're getting in a lot of arguments, they flip the kitchen table, um, they're, they're power struggling, they, they told off their teacher, they got into fights at school, um, they're not doing what they're supposed to. And so, um, so certainly with an externalizing disorder, other people can really easily observe um, what some of those behaviors are as a result of the disorder. Likewise, with um, something like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, we might hear parents or teachers or, um, or others complaining, hey, I'm, I'm really struggling to get them to engage. I'm really struggling to, to get them to stay focused. Um, they're not getting their work done. They're bouncing off the walls. They're, um, they're maybe getting their other classmates distracted or riling them up. And so, so a lot of our um, child serving agencies within our child serving system statewide is really designed to address externalizing disorders because um, because we get so so many complaints and because they tend to be problematic to um, the family system or the social system or the school setting that the child is existing within so because that's the case Again, a lot of our system is designed to, to address those externalizing disorders. If we think about um, the child welfare system, 
certainly when interventions are provided for families, um, typically those interventions are designed for parents and whatever the child protective issue might be. But in the event the child is struggling and requires intervention, it is typically for something like conduct disorder or um, attention deficit disorder, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, similarly, if we think about our entire um, juvenile justice system or youth services system, um, all of that is designed to be able to respond to externalizing disorders. So, dis, um, so behaviors that are disruptive, again, to families, to school systems, um, to the legal system, um, really all of that is geared towards addressing those types of disorders. Um, so in contrast, the other, the other side of this in terms of, of co-occurring disorders and the most common mental health disorders that we would see are internalizing disorders. So those are things like, you can see on the list, post-traumatic stress disorder, general anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, um, general mood disorders, those types of things. And so with internalizing disorders, um, these can sometimes tend to be overlooked um, and they aren't necessarily seen as problematic to the extent um, that externalizing disorders are, not because the diagnosis or um, the different presentations are not as concerning, but simply because they don't necessarily capture the attention of everyone else like behaviors from an externalizing disorder tend to do. So if you've got someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, they may be experiencing symptoms like um, ruminating thoughts or perseverating thoughts. They might be having nightmares. They might be having visceral reactions to certain people, places, or things. They might have really intrusive, um, unpleasant thoughts. And so, so their personal experience of those things aren't necessarily going to um, to catch the attention of, of the people around them necessarily. With generalized anxiety disorder, um, again, this is something that a person might be experiencing a lot of emotional and psychological turmoil internally, um, where they may be feeling excessive feelings of worry. Again, they might be um, perseverating on things, ruminating on things, um, worrying about a lot of what-if scenarios. Um, their anxiety may be preventing them from engaging in pro-social activities or really forming meaningful relationships with others. Um, but again, that, that's not necessarily going to raise red flags um, like an externalizing disorder would. Same with major depressive disorder. Um, someone may be having feelings of hopelessness. They may be struggling to fall asleep or stay asleep. Um, they may not be making plans for the future. They may have um, ongoing feelings of, of sadness and lethargy um, for more than two weeks. However, again, um, maybe around others, they might be able to mask those symptoms or conceal those symptoms, and those wouldn't, wouldn't really catch the attention potentially of or seem problematic in terms of behaviors like externalizing disorders. When we think about these two different categories, um, certainly what we tend to see is that for male adolescents, um, it is more common that we see um, diagnoses um, in line with externalizing disorders. And for female adolescents, it is much more common that we would see diagnoses um, in line with internalizing disorders. And so we do see that, um, that oftentimes um, there's an imbalance in terms of which youth are being referred for services. And again, that is because of how problematic the behaviors are um, within the systems in which they exist. Any questions about that? Okay, so I'll just keep an eye on the chat box again. So, um, so let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is a model that comes from um, our, our system of care um, principles. And so the idea with this model is really that um, youth can have any combination of um, high needs or um, 
high involvement or a, a high level of, of symptom presentation for any of these things combined with low needs, um, low symptom involvement, those kinds of things. So if you look in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see that in quadrant one, um, this would be a youth who maybe has a low level of mental health disorders, a low level of maybe substance experimentation, and this might be a youth that we then identify as maybe needing some substance use disorder education or prevention services. Um, we might consider that they would benefit from outpatient mental health services, and that's how, how we might um, address those particular behaviors. And then it, you can see there's any combination as we kind of move through quadrants two, three, and four. So quadrant two would be um, maybe high needs in terms of mental health issues and low needs in terms of substance use disorder issues. Um, and then quadrant three is, is kind of the, um, the reverse of that. And quadrant four is where you would have a youth who's presenting with really significant mental health issues and really significant substance use disorder issues. And these might be youth that we determine would um, best respond to maybe residential level services for substance use disorder and um, might really um, benefit from wraparound services in terms of mental health issues. Um, we may want to make sure that um, we're being really cognizant about how we involve family in treatment services or maybe how we pull in um, a, a psychiatrist um, to, to really determine whether or not they would benefit from any psychotropic medications and ongoing medication management. So, um, so really we want to make sure that, um, that, we're, that we have an understanding for any particular youth that we're serving of what, what, their, what their combination of issues is and, and we want to have an understanding of how, how those co-occurring disorders um, are interrelated and how they're influencing one another. So um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, this particular slide is really designed to highlight um, that really for two thirds of youth who, who are identified as having co-occurring disorders, um, really the the thought is that likely they have had um, some significant level of, um, of trauma and that almost half of these youth have reported really high severity victimization. And so when, when we talk about high severity, um, we're talking about ongoing complex trauma. So if you think about traumatic events in general, we might, um, there are a number of things we could think of as an isolated incident that could result in post-traumatic stress. So if someone is in a car accident um, and suffers severe um, injuries or, or, or knew that they potentially their injuries were life-threatening, um, if someone experienced a, a house fire and, and lost most of their possessions and had to be relocated, those would be isolated incidents of trauma that certainly we might experience um, symptoms of post-traumatic stress, but when we're talking about high severity victimization, what we're really talking about is complex trauma. So complex trauma um, takes place over a significant period of time. It can involve multiple traumatic events. Um, sometimes the, the trauma is being perpetrated by others, and, and in those instances, um, it can involve a person in a position of trust, such as a parent, or a close relative, um, maybe anyone else in a position of power, maybe a sibling, a cousin, a neighbor, something like that. Um, it can include um, sexual abuse. Um, there can sometimes be multiple perpetrators over the course of someone's childhood or adolescence. Um, and then one of the um, one of the significant um, pieces that, um, that goes alongside this is that for a lot of these youth, um, if they were courageous enough to report, um, sometimes maybe a non-offending parent or caregiver didn't necessarily believe them or take steps to keep them safe from whoever 
the identified perpetrator was. And so, um, so it's important to keep in mind that with youth who are presenting, again, with both mental health disorders and substance use disorders um, as co-occurring disorders, that almost half of them um, have had this as part of their, their history. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, and so this is really just a, an illustration that, um, you know, kind of how, how this can sort of develop for youth. So you've got um, children who are exposed to trauma throughout the course of their childhood. And again, we're really talking about complex trauma um, over many years. Um, that certainly that is going to increase their risk for adolescent substance use and for them to experiment and maybe um, be seeking out substance use um, as a coping skill. Um, and then, of course, this is associated with mental health issues. And then we know um, that this really impacts the likelihood um, that they can um, be successful over the, the course of their, um, their entire adulthood. And so when we think about how trauma really um, influences or leads to co-occurring disorders, certainly we know that trauma impacts one's mental health. And when one's mental health is, um, is compromised, oftentimes any one of us would look for ways in which we could um, successfully address um, those symptoms or alleviate those symptoms or the discomfort of those symptoms. And for adolescents, certainly um, substance use is an attractive way of trying to go about that. So let's go to the next slide. So when we're thinking about our overall approach and interventions, we want to, we want to keep in mind that um, clinical services alone um, might not necessarily be enough to, to really successfully address the issue. So we'll go to the next slide. So let's talk about what effective programs typically look like. So this first point on this um, particular slide um, talks about that an effective program would really take a more tolerant and persuasive approach rather than um, being confrontational with youth. And so um, when we think about what's really going to work with youth, I know that um, historically our substance use disorder serving system has really tried to push um, abstinence as um, certainly the goal. And so in working with youth, a lot of times um, a youth who has a co-occurring disorder um, may have turned to, let's say, alcohol or marijuana as something that um, they've started to engage in. Maybe they're using more frequently. Maybe they're using with friends. Maybe it's impacting um, how they're, they're getting schoolwork done or interacting with family. And so um, these youth will then end up with a substance use disorder provider whose, of course, goal is to help them achieve abstinence. And so um, in the past, a lot of our treatment providers have taken an approach of um, really trying to push abstinence as, as the goal, but then um, sometimes it becomes the expectation right out of the gate, and there, there can end up being um, a, a large focus placed on abstinence immediately and then working to monitor that abstinence throughout the course of treatment. And this becomes problematic for a number of reasons. Um, one, if we're working with a youth who has a diagnosis of conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder, as many of you know, if you try to tell a youth to, um, to quit smoking marijuana or to stop drinking, um, that in and of itself may motivate them to do it more. Um, and for youth who have internalizing disorders, um, to tell a youth that um, right out of the gate that they need to stop using, essentially what we're telling them is to abandon potentially the one and only coping skill that has been effective in them um, trying to alleviate symptoms of depression or anxiety or post-traumatic stress. And so certainly that, that doesn't mean that it's a healthy coping skill, 
Um, but it's really important and validating for youth when providers are able to say, I get it, I get that this is working for you. And it's maybe the first thing that has ever worked for you. And I would be very foolish to say, stop using the thing that is working for you um, without helping to support you develop, developing any other coping skills to, to substitute in for that. And so when it comes to this idea of a more tolerant um, behavioral health um, youth serving system, certainly we don't want to normalize and accept adolescent substance use, but we want to, we want to acknowledge them for you found something that works, albeit it's, it's working, it's a maladaptive coping skill and it's creating some of these other issues for you, but you found something that works. What is it? about your marijuana use that you like? What is help, how is that helping you? What are the benefits of your alcohol use? What does that do for you? And by really getting an understanding of, yeah, this helps me relate to my peers. This helps me finally fall asleep. This helps me finally stop thinking about whatever the thing is that I can't stop thinking about, or this is the only thing that is helping me improve my mood by giving our youth an opportunity to really, um, to really communicate that and to really think through, oh, these are, these are the benefits and this is what I, I keep going after and this is what is getting in the way of me being clean and sober. Um, by helping them examine that in a way where we're not judging or we're not saying hard and fast, you can't do this, you can't be in this program and get a hot UA, you can't blow hot on another BA or you're out. So, so when we take this approach of, yeah, tell me, tell me how this works for you, um, that typically um, helps to disarm our youth in um, feeling like they have to defend the behavior um, or feeling like we just simply won't understand them. Um, this second point, this idea of using peer modeling in group therapy, we know there's a lot of research out there um, specifically with substance use disorders and youth um, that we don't ever want to take a youth who maybe is in that um, those lower quadrants in terms of substance use disorder issues and place them with youth who have um, a higher level of involvement in substance use disorder issues because what the research tells us is that um, that will that will inadvertently um, negatively impact the youth who has a low level of involvement and will likely influence them to use more. And so when we talk about using peer modeling in group psychotherapy, um, we really want to identify youth who have maybe progressed through treatment over time to the extent that they, um, they're able to, to model pro-social skills, they're able to maybe talk about what worked for them, how they overcame barriers, and then have them as a, a component and a support um, piece of, of another youth treatment um, in terms of, of a group therapy setting. So, um, so we do want to, to lean into youth who have achieved some successes over time um, so that they can, they can be part of um, maybe giving information to other youth who are, are just starting the process. And then continuity of care. Um, this is really the idea that we're not just going to say, okay, your course of treatment is going to be eight weeks, or this is what insurance is gonna cover, or this is what was mandated by your juvenile probation officer, or your caseworker, or whoever else. We really wanna come up with a solid plan for, this is how we are going to engage you in treatment services in a really meaningful way so that you feel invested and you feel um, empowered to, to really um, contribute to how this is all going to go. And then once treatment is considered completed, how are we then going to support youth as they navigate what are very likely the same circumstances they were in prior to treatment in such a way that they don't feel like they were simply placed back into their old circumstances in which there is a very high likelihood they would result back to one, their old substance use issues, and two, potentially um, their old mental health struggles as well. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
Okay. So in terms of characteristics of systems that are really focused on the overall outcome of recovery, um, certainly taking a look at system level change, which, um, which at the Office of Behavioral Health, this is something that um, we are continually striving to do. So um, there are very many initiatives in which um, we take a look at what treatment curricula are we finding is um, either an evidence-based practice or a promising practice that we really want to get the word out to our providers about, um, what are different grant-funded initiatives or maybe legislative initiatives that are really going to help us design programming um, that will, will give us a good sense of what's maybe working better and then how can we broadly apply that um, system-wide. And so certainly that's, that's something that we're always looking at, but most importantly, hearing from providers about what the needs are and what providers see as, as gaps in services, um, that, that's certainly one of the most helpful pieces of this. Um, so efficiently using existing resources. So I think um, certainly in today's current climate, I think all of our resources are temporarily changed and potentially um, changed long-term. And so when we think about really taking a look at what our community resources are, um, presently we, we may also be needing to take a look at um, how those are potentially modified or placed on hold. Um, very many of you are likely struggling with um, maybe providing telehealth services or doing everything by phone. And we know that in this particular field, that can be so incredibly challenging because our work tends to be really person-centered um, and relationally based. And so, um, so I think that taking a look at what the existing resources are and then also getting an understanding of, of how those are currently impacted um, presently really, um, really would be our focus. And again, I mentioned incorporating best practices. Um, one of the things that we do at the Office of Behavioral Health, I had mentioned earlier, um, is regulatory oversight of the mental health system and the substance use disorder system. And that is entirely um, with the hopes of ensuring that no matter who someone is or where they are in the state, if they go to an agency that is regulated by us, they're going to get the same um, standard of care and they're going to go through a very similar process in terms of they will get an, an assessment, they will have a service plan developed, they will be um, provided services um, utilizing evidence-based practices by staff who are um, either licensed or credentialed or working towards licensing or credentialing or who are being supervised appropriately. We want to make sure that everyone who's accessing services has um, those same standards. And then this idea of integrated treatment philosophies, this is really the thought that um, when it comes to how treatment is provided, um, we don't necessarily want to look at mental health and substance use disorder services as two siloed and separate issues, that they really are interrelated. And we know that so often it is the result of trauma and mental health issues that youth end up um, seeking out substances as, a, again, a way to cope. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is um, just as a, a general question to the group, and if you want to um, put your answers into the chat box, what are some of the, the major issues that you're seeing in your communities related to issues that youth are struggling with and issues that the community is struggling with meeting for youth? And is everyone able to hear me okay still? So and in the interest of time, we'll keep going and, and certainly anything that folks put in the chat box, um, we can, can visit as we're going over questions. So let's go to the next slide. So um, as you're thinking about challenges for your youth as well as what's available in your community, I wanted to make sure that everyone had this particular resource and um, this is our, this is a link to the Office of Behavioral Health um, licensing and designation database and electronic resource services site. 
Um, so that's what the backslash ladder stands for. If you are looking for um, maybe some additional resources or other options for meeting the treatment needs of youth that you're, you're serving, um, you can go to this particular website and it allows you to search any and all of our licensed and designated sites in the state and you can go through and you can select different options like this site is licensed for youth services or maybe licensed for something like youth DUI or um, youth minor in possession treatment. You can self-select if you're looking for um, outpatient services or residential level of services. You can look within regions and so this is just one of our, our resources to help folks find services if you're looking. So let's go to the next slide. So there are practice guidelines um, that were developed by the system of care. And so um, folks may be familiar that um, the state of Colorado has um, been awarded the, the system of care grant from the federal government. I think we're on our sixth or seventh year now. And so we have um, communities of excellence throughout, I, I wanna say, somewhere between 10 and 15 counties in our state. And so this idea of a system of care is really, um, I think what many of, of us all work within, that we want to work in a, a child and family serving system that is coordinated, that is strategic, um, that is sharing information in a meaningful way. And so um, these practice guidelines for serving adolescents with co-occurring disorders um, come from the system of care. So I just wanted to give that background. And so, um, so you can kind of look through that certainly we would want um, all of our youth to have both a mental health assessment or an assessment that really explores um, both mental health issues and substance use disorder issues and is really looking at the relationship of those two things and maybe what has influenced the other. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide because I know we're running a little short on time. Um, and then certainly we want to make sure that um, that access is um, is a reality. And so that's why I share that um, that previous link about how to maybe search for services that maybe your particular setting doesn't offer, or um, you identify that a youth needs maybe different services than what your agency currently offers. We want to make sure that. Um, that services are provided in a way that they are as responsive to the needs of the youth and the family as possible. And that, that includes um, really looking at generational needs within, um, within the, the family, um, culturally appropriate services, so making sure that we have providers who um, either know and understand how to use an interpreter in the provision of services or a provider who is um, maybe bilingual or multilingual and able to provide services in the client's um, preferred language spoken. Um, and again, this point that abstinence for substance use disorder is a goal, um, but it should never be a requirement of admission into treatment or remaining in treatment. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so you can see a couple of more points here. So one of the things that we really want to stress is that services be strength-based. Um, and so a lot of times I think this can be, um, this can be really difficult to incorporate strengths into how we provide services because people aren't showing up on our doorstep saying, hey, I've got all of these wonderful qualities that are, are really influencing my life. People are showing up with major issues, and it's the major issues um, that they're wanting to address. So this idea of being strength-based um, can seem a little uh, unnatural or maybe um, even silly to think about as we're looking at maybe all of these deficits that folks are working with. But we do, we do wanna make sure that we have a good sense of what an adolescent's strengths are as well as the strengths of the family so that we can really pull on those um, and lean on those as we are looking at helping them develop coping skills for things like depression or anxiety or managing anger or um, addressing substance use disorder issues. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, a couple more highlights. So 
Um, one of the things that we really focus on at our office is this idea that we want our behavioral health workforce to have um, as much training and support as, as they need to be able to effectively meet the needs of adolescents who, again, have both mental health issues and substance use disorder issues. We do a lot of work with um, higher education institutions um, to get an understanding of when people go for a degree in counseling or social work or psychology, what are they really learning about substance use disorders um, with those degrees and vice versa. Um, if someone is going through um, what we've developed as our certified addiction counselor training program, um, not only are, are they getting information about how to respond to substance use disorder issues, um, but we've really taken a look at developing curriculum um, that helps to give them, um, you know, some sense of, of how mental health disorders are impacting um, those behaviors as well. And so for any of you who have maybe gone through um, the CAP training program, certainly you, you could speak to that as well. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so again, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, we want, we want programs to be able to not only meet the needs of youth, but really take a look at the family as well. We all know that um, if we take a youth out of their, their home setting and we um, provide them with all of this treatment and support and then put them right back into the setting in which they were struggling, um, the likelihood that they will maintain sobriety or recovery from mental health issues is pretty small if we don't work to impact that system as well. So pulling in family, pulling in um, individuals who they see as really strong supports, these could be identified friends, these could be um, extended relatives. We want to make sure that, um, that we're not just looking at an adolescent as the quote unquote identified patient that, okay, you're the one whose behaviors have, have gotten you here and so we're just gonna fix you and, and that's that. We wanna really have an understanding of, um, you know, where the, where the dysfunction and where the issues may lie in terms of the entire system in which they're, they're existing. And sometimes we can do that um, in-house in our own agencies and sometimes we may need to look at what's available in the community. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the challenges, and again, I'm, I'm tracking the time here. Um, you all could probably speak um, much better to the challenges that currently exist in trying to serve adolescents with co-occurring disorders in your communities, in your agencies than I could. Um, we know that um, sometimes services occur in silos, we know that um, efforts to coordinate can be difficult. We know that there are funding challenges. We know um, that in terms of overall capacity, that sometimes there are just not enough providers to be able to provide the services that a youth needs at that particular point in time. Um, we know that there's issues with funding, that there's issues with, um, with workforce. We really struggle statewide to, um, to really cultivate a, and maintain a sufficient workforce because we know that this work is hard and people burn out and they don't necessarily want to continue doing it. So we lose a lot of providers um, for those reasons. And so, um, and I'm sure that you could speak to, again, very many more challenges that, that aren't on this slide. Um, let's go to the next slide. And again, you know, the question is, you know, what is going on in your community that's maybe specifically getting in the way of meeting these needs? Um, and something for folks to think about, or again, you could always put responses in the chat box. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so again, some recommendations, and these are some things that I had previously mentioned um, in another slide, things that um, that we want to keep in mind when we're responding to youth. Again, we want to be doing um, screening and assessment that really is ascertaining what, what the issues are um, related to mental health and substance use disorder. In a perfect world, we would have a wide variety of options for our youth um, and ability to access those with no barriers um, in terms of funding, and we would have a lot of training and support for our providers. Um, and as much as we can foster that in our own agencies, um, we certainly want folks to, to be thinking about that. 
system. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, I've done a lot of talking at you in this, um, in this last hour. So I'd like to just open it up to any questions or comments folks have about any of the information we've gone over. And I don't know if there's a way to take everybody off mute. Do you guys want to take a, take a look at uh, boxes? There, can you take that too? Oh, that. Uh, well, that one? Yeah. Jane, I just want to say that I appreciate it. Push my own sauce. Do you just want to just <laughs> do what? <laughs> oh, just pick it. <laughs> oh, I see what you did. Okay. Rice. <laughs> Okay, um, maybe the unmute all wasn't the best option. <laughs> so it's, Sam, you're, uh, you're good to go there. I'll unmute you. Awesome. Um, Jane, I just want to say I appreciate your um, emphasis on recognizing adolescents coping mechanisms, even if they are maladaptive. I think that's a really important perspective to bring into the conversation, kind of that radical acceptance that then moves into the 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 new advice or the new the new conversation so i really appreciate that um i did have a question about um how you have seen people um kind of tease out um the best interventions for maybe adolescents who are exhibiting traits that may qualify them for an odd or other kind of externalized diagnosis but it's actually um them kind of reacting to an internalized disorder, if that makes sense. One of the things that I, I saw, so, and are you able to hear me still? Okay, one of the things that I saw um, really frequently for youth who are involved in the child welfare system or who were coming into um, the youth services system were youth who had, um, diagnoses of conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, because of the things that they were engaging in. And, and so, for example, maybe some criminal behaviors as a result of, of their involvement with a, um, a social group that was really involved in substance use or um, maybe criminal behavior as a, as a result of being involved in maybe a, a youth gang culture, something like that. And then to really talk with the youth, it wasn't, it wasn't an oppositional defiant disorder at all. And it wasn't a conduct disorder issue at all. These were youth who were so desperate to be accepted by anyone or to form um, any semblance of what they thought was a genuine relationship that, that engaging in the criminal or the oppositional behavior, it was just a necessary evil of, of gaining that acceptance from a peer group. And so the danger then becomes when we, don't, when we don't understand the motivation for the behaviors and we simply chalk it up to, oh, this youth is, um, they just wanna argue, they don't wanna follow the rules. And we don't understand that, that maybe it's their level of, of social insecurity that, um, that they don't feel accepted or maybe that um, they've been so hurt by family members that, yes, they are willing to do whatever the peers say. Um, so, so absolutely, your point is, um, is such a valuable one that um, not only do we want to just look at the behaviors that fall in line with what the diagnosis is, we want to understand what is really motivating those behaviors as an underlying issue. Because to your point, they may be doing dirt for their friends or a gang or something like that. Um, but that just may demonstrate how desperate they are to to not feel isolated, to not feel depressed, to not feel rejected, those things. So, yeah, excellent point. Any other questions? Okay, well, it looks like we are a minute away from the end of our time together. This is my contact information. Um, for anyone who has a question, maybe afterwards, if you wanna email me or call me, 
Um, currently, my desk phone is being forwarded to my cell phone, um, so, so that should work just fine. So um, yeah, if anything comes up afterwards, feel free to reach out. And I really appreciate everyone taking the time to attend. And again, I know it's, it's been crazy for folks trying to juggle being at home or maybe in a different setting than you normally are, but I, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, and just as a reminder to everyone who is attending the training, um, if you are attending live, Gianna and myself have posted the post-training um, survey link into the chat box. If you wouldn't mind, please making sure that you go ahead and fill that out. If you are watching this recorded after uh, April 1st, um, you need to please make sure to click on the uh, link that is listed there on the slide, the second link. Um, and make sure that that gets done by June 30th to receive credit. But again, for those of you watching live, um, the SurveyMonkey link has been posted into the chat box. And just another reminder that if you did not <clears throat> at some point throughout this training, um, please make sure to enter your name, title, agency, and email address into the chat box so that you can get uh, credit for having been here. Otherwise, uh, again, thank you, Jane, and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, we'll go ahead and leave the um, um, webinar up live for a few minutes so that folks can enter their names if they hadn't already um, and get the link to that post-training survey. Um, but if anyone has any questions for Jane, she did leave her contact info. You feel free to reach out to us as well and we can connect you with her. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.